Hey everyone, it's uh, David Barnett from davidcbarnett.com, the blog site, YouTube channel, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play podcast, where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses. Today, I've got a, a, a great guest, and uh, I, I, before I introduce him, I just want to say how I met him. Uh, I just happened to be on LinkedIn, and a connection of mine liked one of Finn's comments that he had posted and LinkedIn thought that I might find it interesting, and I did. So I ended up connecting with Finn, and we met each other over LinkedIn. And Finn is an organizer of worker cooperatives. And j just to get us going, Finn, could you explain to everyone what a worker cooperative is? And then maybe we'll get into a little bit of your background about how you came to be an organizer. Yeah, um, a worker cooperative is a company that's 100% owned and controlled by its employees. And that has actually been part of my entire life. I grew up on a farm in Denmark where, in the village where I lived, a lot of the businesses were cooperatives. The grocery store was a cooperative, the bank was a cooperative. My father is a farmer owned with other farmers, several businesses with them, and they were all cooperatives. So at the first, the first day of my first job, I, realized that when I worked a little bit of time, somebody else got some of it, what I just produced that day. And it, I didn't really think that was fair. So I talked to other people about it, but they couldn't really see that there was a way around that. <laughs> so a few years you're ago- about, You're talking about working a traditional job for a, a private yes. business. Okay. Absolutely, yes. So a few years ago, um, I, I met a woman at a, um, at a meetup, situation where she had scheduled a meeting for people to come and talk about what they wanted to do. And I was the only one there, so I got to talk about cooperatives for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and she never heard of it before, just like you or most other people. So, and she immediately felt that it was, had value. So she said, you should go out and start talking to people about that again. So I did, and it's been a couple of years now. Well, it's interesting because I'm familiar with cooperatives. Um, I, I've just never run into worker-owned cooperatives because right. uh, when I was growing up, the grocery store that my mom used to go to was a co-op, but it was owned by the shoppers. Yeah. And, and the yes. workers were employees of the co-op. And, and uh, close to my house, there's an, an office for a cooperative insurance agency. And of course, there are credit unions around, which, which are also cooperatives. But they're always owned by the customers. And the people who work in them are employees, right? And so th this is what made this idea a little bit different uh, and, and made me curious um, because I, I've heard of employees buying a business from a seller, from the owner, but it's usually one employee who becomes a, you know, the new private owner or maybe a small group. Um, I talked with uh, three or four plumbers about a year ago who were looking at buying the, the business that they were working in. And they were three or four of about 20 people. So again, it would have continued to be a private business just with a new kind of ownership group. So the, the worker cooperative, I mean, you, you had a bunch of them over in Denmark since coming to the U S how, what kinds of businesses do you see that have made this, this arrangement? <clears throat> there are not many of them. There are only about 400 in the entire United States. So that's not a lot of statistics that we have. Okay. But they've been around for a very long time, actually, the few that have been around. Um, uh, there's an organization called the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, and they have now started uh, keeping track of these statistics, how many there are, what industries they're in, how many people work in them, and, stuff, and that kind of things. So you can actually download that from their website at this point. Okay. But there are only about 450 of them and uh, 7,000 people work in them. So it's not a lot. Okay. And, and worker cooperatives typically are not startup businesses. The, usually it's a, it's a private business that converts into one. Is that correct? Um, not entirely. Um, New York City has um, a whole... Um, a whole system of uh, organizations that organize worker cooperatives from scratch. Okay. And particularly um, 
house cleaning cooperatives. Uh, immigrant women do that a lot. So uh, nationwide, there is, I don't know, maybe more than half of all the new ones are from from start from startups. Okay. And uh, maybe about 10 or so are conversions. Okay. That, annually. That's interesting because I know that uh, here where I live, um, I've, I've run into some people who've told me about a group of uh, African refugees who started a janitorial business. And I don't think they, they chose a co-op format. I think they just created a general partnership. Yeah. But the same kind of idea, just a, a bunch of people got together to make a business, probably because maybe they couldn't find a good job or something. They, they were yeah, they looking. needed to make a living. That's exactly what it's about. It's a, it's a way for you to get your, need, your needs met, in this particular case, salary. <laughs> Or wages. So, I mean, in the beginning of the interview, you expressed that um, when you were working as an employee in a private company, you felt that part of your work was going, you know, to benefit somebody else. Yeah. And in the worker cooperative, since the workers are the owners, all the benefit ends up going back to them. So, would you say that there's a certain entrepreneurial spirit amongst the workers wanting to build and, and, and create these businesses? Um, sometimes uh, a business, a start, startup business is usually because somebody has a vision for something. Okay. And then there are followers. It's probably rare that everybody has the same level of leadership skills or even um, inclination. So yeah, it's a lot of times it's one person who, has, who leads, but everybody follows. Okay. And, and, instead of wanting to build a, you know, sort of a business where they can capitalize on everyone else, they're kind of inviting everyone else to come along with them. Yeah. The whole idea is to, that there's not one person who, who uh, gets rich on the backs of somebody else. Everybody shares in the, in the proceeds from the business. Yeah. So creating a worker cooperative is an exit strategy though for, a, for a private business owner. I mean, they could choose to sell their business, into a worker cooperative made up of their employees. Um, when, when that happens, can you describe that process to us a little bit? Because I would have a whole bunch of questions about the financing, you know, would the workers contribute money towards the purchase? How does that typically work? Well, uh, <clears throat> it, it comes, usually comes from the owner, except that the owners usually don't know that this is even possible. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess the owner will make a proposal to the employees that you can take over the business maybe over a period of time, but yeah, you, but they need a lot of education first. So it's a little bit different from just uh, selling it to a management team, for example, because everybody needs to understand, have at least have a basic understanding of how the business makes money and how they get paid to be able to make these decisions. Right. In, in doing some reading before our interview, I came across the term democratizing the business. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Sort of educating everyone in the business, how the business works and how it makes money and what kinds of decisions. And, and even though everyone's an owner, there still has to be a certain degree of, of uh, direction and authority within the business, right? Yeah, so uh, if you are maybe three or four or five people, everybody is pretty much on the board. So everybody has one share, one vote. If you are maybe 20 people, that becomes impractical maybe. Mm -hmm. So you would then elect a board of directors who makes the uh, policy decisions. So you have an annual meeting where you elect new officers and they will hire maybe a manager to do the day-to-day. Yeah. Okay. So that's the democratic process, basically. And so in a worker cooperative, if somebody is doing a management role and somebody is doing, um, uh, say, a, a production role in, in the private workforce, maybe the manager would be earning a higher salary. Yeah. Is this the same kind of thing that happens in the worker co-op or do people take the same compensation? See, you have to compete for talent like everybody else does. So if you need somebody with specialized management skills, you 
it could be difficult to get somebody at twenty dollars an hour, for example. Right. So then you would need to agree to pay that person more. So they they typically will have the same pay, but they may 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 they make tiers: one tier for new hires and one tier for uh, seniors and one tier for management. Something like that they would do. Yeah. Okay, and what? happens in a worker co-op for example if uh if if someone's not performing and they need to be dismissed yeah that that would be part of the um, uh uh either bylaws if it's a corp it's a c corp or in the uh memorandum of, of operation line that is specific i mean specify very detailed how you would do that and it would typically be an annual meeting uh, meeting uh item or or uh, the uh, board of directors would have the authority to do that. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned a memorandum of operation. So um, basically there's some kind of document which outlines the, the rules of how we're going to run this business together. And everyone who comes into it has to kind of sign on to that saying they agree to this, uh, this understanding. Okay. Um, If so, if something happens in the marketplace, let's say you have a worker cooperative with 50 employees and then they lose a major customer and the business has to, has to reduce itself in size, the management would just have to make a decision. We have to lay off these people and, and, and that would be it, just like any regular business? Well, <clears throat> that happens very rarely. <laughs> Okay. First of all, you try to get it not to get into a situation where you rely only on one customer. You try to split it out. But it happened for a, 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 a cooperative in Spain where the, um, I think they were making refrigerators or something like that, the, the just bottom, and they just couldn't justify having everybody on board anymore. So they worked together with other cooperatives in the area. We don't have that in the United States yet, but over there they did. So then some of them got moved to other cooperatives or um, some of the workers would reduce their hours, so there would be hours to the ones who would normally be laid off in a in, a, in an investor-owned company. Okay. So they kind of share the work as well. So yeah, they they the solidarity solidarity the solidarity is very is pretty much the backbone of this whole thing. Okay. Um, so when somebody gets when, when you need a new employee and someone gets hired by a worker cooperative, does a person contribute capital or do they they just sign join in and, and become an owner like how how does that normally work if you're a member of a of a credit union which is like you said it's also a cooperative you are, your first five dollars that you put in is your membership fee that's not enough in a worker cooperative typically it'll be somewhere between i don't know five hundred dollars or if even as high as fifteen thousand dollars would you be your buy-in so it's it's a real equity stake, like it's a yes. real contribution to the balance sheet. The idea is that um, it needs to be enough that if the business fails, it hurts. Right. But it can't be so high that it becomes prohibitive for you to join. Well, that, it's an interesting thing you bring up because, you know, banks, when they make a loan to a business person, they want to know that the business person is committed to the project and they want to see yes. that the business person has committed a lot of money. Yeah. What I saw with the local grocery store co-op is that because the the community members put so little in, they didn't they didn't consider themselves owners. They just kind of considered it like any other grocery store. Yeah. And if if a competing grocery store had a big sale on chicken, they they would just go over there. They wouldn't yeah. they they didn't put themselves in the position of saying, "Hey, I own my own grocery store. I'm going to shop there." And what eventually happened in that situation is the the ownership were so disinterested that management just kind of ran it to their own benefit. And ultimately it led to a bankruptcy of that organization. Um, they just, they got into debt and uh, you know, the owners, people like my mom who put in five bucks didn't really care. Like they could just go to a different grocery store. So in this situation, everybody has a real vested interest in making sure these businesses are successful. Yeah. You, you know that you're, that your coworker ha- has a stake in it, uh, so that they have skin in the game, just like you have yourself. You know that they are as committed as you are, 
And it also has to do with finding financing. If you don't want to do a conversion, then you got to have to find some outside financing. And if you don't have any skin in the game, they're not going to lend you any money. Right. And for a lot of the financing, is it common for the members of the cooperative to agree to a personal guarantee, for example, on a debt? Or is that typically not something that's done? Um, now we have financing institutions where you don't have to have personal guarantees. Um, particularly one, it's a community development in this, uh, financial institution, CDFI. It's called the working world. They don't require uh, personal guarantees. And there are five other, uh, four or five other CDFIs around the country that lend to this kind of situation that they don't require it either. And, and these are financial institutions, I'm guessing, that are kind of born from the same movement. The yeah, yeah. Similar people with similar goals, and, and they're looking for ways that they can help yeah. others. Yeah. For example, uh, the uh, uh, Cooperative Fund of New England has been around for 50 years, lending to cooperatives for 50 years. Okay. They understand how it works. Is there any um, statistics on the difference in failure rates for cooperative businesses, worker cooperatives versus uh, privately owned business? Not much. But again, the U.S. Federation of Co Worker Cooperatives are working on that. And now we've got a new uh, law that was pa passed by Congress last year, Main Street Employee Ownership Act. Okay. And that, as part of that, um, the government is now obligated to keep statistics of that. So we will get better records now than we has in the past. Yeah. Okay. And, but and, there's a good chance that the employee owners, owned companies are more resilient than other companies. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I was, you know, last night I was just thinking about what our conversation was going to be today. And, and I was starting to think, you know, in a privately owned business, uh, oftentimes because of the risk of the business, what an owner will do is they'll want to maintain a certain amount of leverage. They'll want to take profits out of the business in case the business fails or something. But in a, in a worker owned business, the long-term goal is going to be the stability of employment. Yeah. And so, you know, profits are probably going to be reinvested in you know, plant and equipment like any business has to, but probably in reducing debt, which, which would mean that a, a successful worker cooperative is probably going to end up with a really strong balance sheet um, at the end of the day. You know, lots of equity, very little debt, um, which would make it a strong organization as far as weathering any kind of market downturn. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so do the workers, you know, they contribute equity to be a part of it, when they leave, so if they re reach retirement age, do they then get to sell their equity stake? No, <clears throat> only back to the company. Okay. So they, it's not a call. It's, it's not really a share. We call it a buy-in to more accurately describe what it is, because you don't get um, profits according to how many shares you own. You can only own one. Yeah. And uh, the profits are distributed according to how much labor you contributed, not how much money you contributed. Okay, so it has to do with uh, with how many hours you work and what your yes. hourly rate has been in yes. has been set. Okay, exactly. So uh, when you uh, terminate your uh, membership, you would get your membership share back. Let's say it's a thousand dollars, for example. Typically, okay. there is no return on that portion of your investment, but some do. Some have a small return on that as well, but usually not. What, and you know, I guess if there's, if there's a profit distribution every year, those returns would have been distributed out to the members over the course of time anyway. Uh, I'm guessing some worker cooperatives maybe hold some back in a reserve, you know, in case of problems or unforeseen issues. Yeah. They would, they, they would decide on a portion that would be kept back <clears throat> for, uh, I don't know, investment in new equipment or building or whatever you need. Yeah. That's owned collectively, not individually. And, and all of these kinds of things, these are all what's spelled out in that memorandum of operations. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are there certain industries in particular that, that this has been more popular in? <clears throat> um, 
again, the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives has statistics on that, and I don't remember exactly what they say, but um, for startups, you're looking for um, something with that's labor intensive, not too hard to learn, and not, that doesn't require too much capital, like uh, home cleaning uh, mm -hmm. cooperatives that we see in the, United, in, the, in the New York City, and stuff like that. Um, but also light manufacturing, and then now I'm hearing that uh, uh, urban farming, or even ordinary farming, and food uh, processing, food production, uh, big, like I heard that farmers only get 7% of every dollar that you spend on groceries. So the idea is to capture more of that for the workers. Mm. Yeah. I, I, well, I, um, I happen to know some farmers and, and uh, the, there, there's so many steps in the, in the logistical chain from the farm to the grocery store where people go and buy food and every one of those steps is either moving the food or packaging the food or all those people are making money from start to finish. Yep. And uh, what I've noticed is that there's been this real growth in farmers opening up little businesses, you know, like uh, uh, fresh produce stores and things like this, where they're taking their stuff directly in to try to get a bigger share of that, of that margin. Yeah, exactly. So instead of uh, growing potatoes, you sell potato chips or french fries or whatever so you capture a bigger part of the, the final product yeah there's um here in canada we have a giant uh, dairy cooperative okay which uh agro pure i think they're called and and they are owned by farmers you know they span several provinces and they produce cheese and ice cream and all that kind of stuff yeah. um and I guess that's a good example of a, almost an example of a worker cooperative because it's a co-op owned by the production side, not the customer side. Actually, it would be called a producer cooperative. Okay. So there are consumer cooperatives like uh, uh, credit unions and grocery stores. And then there are producer cooperatives, which are like farmers owning uh, the, um, the distribution links, you know, processing. Uh, uh, Florida's Natural, I believe, is a cooperative. Uh, Sunkist, uh, Sun maybe. Uh, Lando Lakes is a, a producer okay. cooperative. And then we have worker cooperatives as the third uh, group of cooperatives, yeah. And it's certainly a lot of the names you just mentioned are recognizable. I mean, these are these are big organizations. Yeah, people just don't know that they are cooperatives, and they don't make a big deal out of being a cooperative either. Um, the cooperative movement in the United States is uh, about uh, over two million people work in cooperatives, and uh, they generate uh, over six hundred billion dollars in revenue. People don't know that they are, but they are. So if a business owner who's watching this conversation says, you know what, I want to sell my business. I know it can be difficult to find someone who can buy the business, who wants to buy the business. I want to make sure that my employees are, you know, are, are going to have an opportunity to work in the future. Maybe this is for me. What would the first thing that that business owner, what would they have to do to see if they could sell their business to their own employees in creating a worker cooperative? I would recommend getting in touch with uh, the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives because they can refer you to people like me around the country who can uh, help you uh, go through that process. With, um, yeah. And is the process pretty much the same everywhere in the United States or does it vary by state? It pretty much varies by company <laughs> okay because they're all different and they all have different requirements and all different situations that they have to go deal with but um, it is true that um, it's better if you can kind of like make a standard way of doing it so that everybody does it the same way because it's easier to uh, attract investors that way because you need to have some outside financing somehow and if they have a set process, then they, they're more comfortable. Yeah. But right now, there's plenty of money that we can use for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's interesting to me because one of, the, one of the biggest problems in selling a business is that the, the owner of the business doesn't control the timeline. 
you don't know how long it's going to take to find a buyer and, and then how long it might take for the mechanics of the deal to actually come together. Right. Whereas in, in this kind of process, you could you know, have more control over the timeline. I guess there's still other factors like investors and, and lenders that have to fit into this, yeah. but it, it, it would, would most of the business sellers in this kind of scenario end up having to finance a good chunk of the transaction themselves? That's almost always required. Mm. And the reason for that is that um, a business is being converted to trans transition is always a little bit more fragile than one that's just chugging along in a daily. So the workers are going to want the, the business seller to have some skin in the game as well. So if something dramatic happens, he can step in and rescue or at least give some directions of where to go. And, and, and he getting paid would depend on that. Would uh, now normally when a business is sold, there's some transition period where the seller helps train the new owner. And I'm guessing in this scenario too, with, with a large amount of seller financing, you would expect the seller to maybe be involved for even a couple of years, at least on a, on a small basis. It depends. If it's a really toxic relationship, you want him to be out as soon as possible. That happens sometimes, but typically you, what you really want to do is to have, the business in the best shape it can possibly be before you make the transaction so that it will have a better chance of surviving. Yeah. So it's interesting. Okay. You brought up the notion of a toxic relationship between the, the workers and the, and the seller. Um, is that because of the relationship before the transition or is it sometimes things happen in the transition that cause things to sour? Uh, typically before. Yeah. Okay. These are, and it's part of my job is to try to make the uh, process as non-adversarial and as collaborative as possible. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes that means separating the two parties, but hopefully not <laughs> so that it can work together. Yeah. Well, Finn Morrison from Long Island, I, it's been a very interesting conversation. You've shed some light for me anyway on something that I didn't know a lot about. Um, and it, obviously another opportunity for people who are looking to exit a business. And, um, I, I've, j I've just learned a lot. I want to thank you very much for joining me today. You're welcome. Anytime. If people want to reach out and find you, uh, is there a place that they can find you online? Uh, fashion dash worker.com. Fashion dash worker.com. Okay. Yeah. I'll link to it in the show notes. And I want to say thank you very much and uh, have a great day. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye.